this then banking forces and uh, they uh, basically what I'm saying is that if you consider quarks and and protons as small uh, mini black holes and then you calculate you know how black holes would have a gravitational field if you calculate the gravitational fields for these mini black holes, then the gravity that these mini black holes generate is strong enough to hold the particles together. And you don't need no strong force or color force, basically that were just pure inventions of modern physics. Do you see what I'm saying? So all of a sudden, you see, one of the problems in current physics is they can't relate gravity to the strong and weak force of the atomic level. Well, that's because they invented forces that don't belong, you know? <laughs> and you just got to re-examine how you're looking at these subatomic particles with the force you already have, which is gravity and electromagnetism, and then all of a sudden it all starts to make sense. You see? Yeah. So basically, uh, this morning we saw that there was very fundamental errors in our concepts of dimensions, and then we saw that these, um, you know, these concepts can be uh, described and uh, and corrected. These concepts can be corrected by using a fractal analogy. And I want to mention that the fractal analogy is much more than just an analogy. It is a whole new way of writing physics, uh, which accommodates for singularity. Basically, the largest error in current physics is they can't deal with singularity, so they make it like it's not there. And, uh, so basically, for instance, uh, Bohm was a collaborator, that, uh, a physicist that collaborated with Einstein, and he tried, you know, Einstein field equation, he wrote to try to unify physics. And he was trying to find a unification theory from the beginning, and he never succeeded before he died. But Bohm was on his case saying, it's got to be holograms. It's got to have to do with holograms where, where every part contains all information and so on. And Einstein was wanting to use hologram, but holograms are not mathematically applicable. You know, it's a nice analogy, but there's no mathematics that are, that, that are useful in hologram that you can apply to the field equations. However, fractals are mathematical equations that can be applied to physics. The other thing that's amazing about fractals is that a fractal equation is a reiteration of an equation that is deterministic, meaning the equation itself is deterministic, a circle and a triangle, right? But when you reiterate it, it becomes an open feedback to infinity. So it has a completely non-linear, non-deterministic output. Right? So from a very deterministic equation, you get a complex, non-linear output. And so you're accounting for both sides of the universe, the deterministic part and the non-deterministic part. Um, so we saw that we can solve these dimension problems by describing dimensions at different resolution of a fractal. We saw that the universe is most likely expanding and contracting at the same time, and that the contractive part of the universe would have to have a very specific collapsing geometry, which is related to a tetrahedral grid that eventually generate 64 tetrahedron as you uh, find or research um, the perfect geometry 
for a collapsing equilibrium, which is the 64 tetrahedron, the 64 tetrahedron grid, which is generated from eight expanding star David coming together, generating the vector equilibrium at the middle, right? And then we saw that each of the tetrahedrons generating the spheres create this incredible geometry of the flower or seed of life that we see emerging at all levels. including the way cells develop in a women's womb. Note as well that we all came out, you know, like good evidence that the universe is a fractal. Nobody seems to notice, but we all come out of other people. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, that is a pretty good evidence of fractals being, you know, part of the foundation of creation, right? Uh, we all came out of our mothers, and, um, and you know, uh, when we look at it, we could say that the tetrahedron in the sphere is actually reproduced in the, crea in, in the creation of new human beings. You see, because uh, you have, you know, uh, a penis, uh, a vector, and a vagina, a sphere, and the penis crosses the event horizon of the sphere. And then it sends another little vector, uh, sperm, out, and uh, that little vector crosses the event horizon of the cell of the egg, right? And then the egg crosses the event horizon of the uterus and, and, uh, and goes in the placenta and, and, and grows and makes a sphere, right? And then the sphere, uh, uh, inside the sphere is the, is the vectors of the legs and the arms and all this, and then eventually that vector moves out and crosses the event horizon of the mother. You see how that, you know, evolves? And then uh, eventually, as you die, you cross the event horizon of your own atoms, you know, and so on. And um, I thought that was interesting. But as well, all of life emerges out of water. And the water molecule, H2O, is a tetrahedron. You see? So the water molecule, and so is the silica molecule, uh, are like the transducer for the vacuum information to move the information through into this level of the resolution of reality. Why do I think that water is a transducer? Well, by observation, everything emerges out of water, and if the vacuum geometry is tetrahedral, you would assume that the vehicle that brings the vacuum geometry information through would have to be tetrahedral. It would have to match, and it does. But what's really interesting is that as it, do, as it does that, water is the only element we know of that expands when it cools and contracts when it warms. So it has a completely reverse thermodynamic structure. And that's the link across the event horizon. It has a thermodynamic link because the vacuum goes towards absolute zero and the electromagnetic field goes towards heat. So, um, 
There was something else on what I was going to say, but I just lost it. Um, well, in any case, from the water molecule, uh, oh yeah, the water damp is an extremely good example of the dynamics of space creating reality. Let's imagine a water droplet falling from the sky. It's a sphere falling through space. Now, as the sphere cools down, it reverts back to its smallest dynamic. It contracts to its smaller dynamic, to its most stable dynamics. And what does it do? It makes a snowflake, right? The snowflake is an hexagonal vector equilibrium. 